Well, I think um, we're quite ready to start. Um, welcome one, welcome all. Um, my name is Father Dragos um, Heresko. I'm the principal of the Orthodox Institute here in Cambridge. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all and to welcome um, Reverend Professor Francis Young and Dr. Peter Marcano for um, this uh, first conversation day of the Institute in this academic year. Um, it's, a, it's a long way coming, this conversation day, in a way, because we are addressing this topic of um, a disability, the connection between human perfection and disability, and people as being made in the human image and likeness of God, and how do issues of weakness and disability factor into that reality of us being in the image and likeness of God. Um, I will introduce both our speakers a little bit now, and then I'll say a few words um, to provide a little bit more context, possibly. Um, and then um, Professor Young will start this evening. She will lead um, the conversation um, t tonight. Um, if you don't remember, um, if you've been here before, but you don't remember, and if you're here for the first time, the format of this conversation days is that we have two speakers um, from two different Christian traditions um, who take um, turns in discussing a, a, a similar topic. And um, in this dialogue, I think, we, we tend to find um, newness and we tend to find points of connection that we otherwise um, be ignorant of. And um, Professor Young will um, speak for about um, 30 some, something minutes. Um, there will be a chance for um, Dr. Maikan to respond, and then there'll be a chance for you to ask questions for another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a coffee break, and then the second part will be Professor Maikan um, giving his presentation, and the format is the same. Now, um, some of you may be quite familiar with um, Reverend Professor Young. Um, she um, um, has been a, a university lecturer at the Birmingham University most of her life. And um, she uh, received an OBE in 1998 for services to theology. And she, has, um, she was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2004. Her academic publications include, um, and I'll mention just a few of them, From Nicaea to Chalcedon, A Guide to the Literature and Its Background. Um, there was a second edition in 2010. Um, she also wrote Biblical Exegesis and the Formation of Christian Culture. She co-edited the Cambridge History of Early Christian Literature and the Cambridge History of Christianity, Origins to Constantine. Quite famously, I think, um, she served as editor of the volumes 39 to 43 of the Studia Patristica. She also was and continues to be involved with the work of the um, large communities. Um, the large communities, for those of you who do not know, are um, an international organization dedicated to the creation and growth of homes, programs, and support networks for people and with people who have intellectual disabilities. And um, Professor Young's uh, work with Larsh has been prompted um, in no small measure by her own experience of disability that comes from her, from her um, family. She will talk to us a little bit about that this evening. Dr. Mai Khan is um, a teaching fellow at the University of Aberdeen um, he holds a PhD in systematic theology from the same um, institution um, and a um, Master of Theology and a Bachelor of Theology from the University of Bucharest in Romania. His current research focuses on theological anthropology with special focus on disability in the Orthodox tradition. At the moment he is revising his doctoral thesis for publication and co-editing two collective, collective volumes of essays one dealing with the impact of the orthodox ecumenical engagement, and another on Dumitrius Tenilwaya's encounter with the West. Before I uh, wrap up, I just wanted to share a thought that I had. Um, 
It came as I, as we were struggling at the Institute um, in the run-up to this conference to uh, produce a poster for today. And we were talking with Professor Yang and Dr. Mai Khan just before uh, now um, about how we came up to, to create that poster. We were struggling to find an image. We usually use an icon, because um, being an Orthodox Institute, <coughs> there's an abundance of icons um, that we can um, sort of use that can draw inspiration from um, almost any topic. But we're struggling to find a, an, an image to illustrate today's topic. And in conversation, as, as it always happens, we um, settle that ink on using this image of Christ healing the um, blind man from birth. Because we felt that what Christ says um, in that encounter speaks profoundly about God's relationship with disability or how God sees disability um, in ways that might surprise us. It was certainly surprising for all those who were there in that biblical account, who were present there. Um, it's surprising for them to hear that Christ says of that blind man um, blindness, that it was not because of his sins or because of his parents' sins, but that the works of God might be glorified or in some translations, might be revealed in him. So it seems to us that that image of Christ healing the blind man from birth, and in a way positively affirming his disability, not as something that is crippling, not as something that um, would make him an outcast, but something that made him more of a, a vehicle, more of, a, of an inhabitor of God's sanctity and presence, an action felt that is something that we um, could, could sort of lead us into this day. And um, only as a personal indulgence in a way, and only because um, I have stayed with these words for at least a week, I want to read in, in the, um, at the end of what I'm trying to say something that um, Dieter Bonhoeffer writes in um, a sermon of his. Um, about weakness. He says, Have you ever seen a greater mystery in this world than poor people, ill people, insane people, people who cannot help themselves but who have to rely on other people for help, for love, for care? The Christian relation between the strong and the weak is that the strong has to look up to the weak and never to look down. Weakness is holy, therefore we devote ourselves to the weak. Weakness in the eyes of Christ is not the imperfect over against the perfect. Instead, strength is the imperfect and weakness the perfect. Gave me pause for thinking these words of um, Bonhoeffer. And um, probably in that spirit, um, I'd like to hand over to um, Professor Young. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I suddenly thought last night um, I probably ought to bring a picture of my son Arthur and so this morning as I dashed out to catch the train I grabbed a memory stick on which I knew there was a whole lot of pictures of Arthur. Um, I'm going to rush through them and just say one or two things so you get the picture. Um, this is our little inert baby um, our first child and we had no idea uh, what a baby was like if he'd been our second or third we'd have known from the start that something was seriously wrong uh, here he is age two he can barely sit unaided and it's not a very clear picture I apologize for that but it's been it was a color slide and it's his great-grandmother teaching him to clap and he's been clapping ever since um, he's now uh, coming up towards early teens and as you can see still needs to be fed but look at that wonderful wonderful head of hair and here he is age 17 uh, at the height of his achievement he could never walk unaided um, but we went through some difficult periods in which his legs were straightened he'd been crawling around and sitting on the floor all his life and they'd become permanently bent and he was stepping out if you held him up 
That was the height of his achievement. Here he is with his brothers at the middle son's wedding. Um, here he is uh, just about to leave home and go into residential care uh, six and a half years ago. And you can see he's lost his beautiful hair. Um, and that's even more recent. That was my youngest son's wedding that was taken. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was his 50th birthday. Sorry, it was his 50th birthday. But this is going back a while um, when with the Faith and Light organisation, which is associated with um, the L'Arche communities, uh, had a pilgrimage to Lourdes, and we actually managed to get Arthur to Lourdes. It's the only time he's ever been abroad. And here we are on Monday Thursday doing foot washing in the hotel and you see his lovely smile. He, um, uh, the people came round and started washing his feet and he felt the water and he just went, Ooh! <laughs> and he just broke the ice. You know, everybody's sitting there in solemn silence. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of a feel of um, his life. In his early adulthood, his hips permanently dislocated. He is now profoundly disabled physically as well as intellectually. He has never had any language, never had any self-help skills, needs total care. So that's one aspect of my context. The other is that I've spent my life researching on the early Christian fathers, especially those of the Eastern Church. But my own formation is in the Methodist tradition. And addressing the title I was given, I shall divide what I have to say into three parts. First, I shall talk about the image of God, then human perfectibility, and then transfiguration. So, the image of God. The age-old assumption deeply held by many of the fathers has been that it's the mind or soul which is in God's image. After all, in a world full of idolatry, it was important to refuse anthropomorphism, the idea that God was literally or physically in human form. So, the image of God in humankind was generally not felt to be found in the body, though there was some discussion about that at certain points in the early centuries. On the basis that the mind or soul is in God's image, positive acceptance of intelligent persons with physical disabilities was straightforward. An example being the 4th century scholar Didymus the Blind, who was nicknamed the Seer because he saw more profoundly than those with physical sight. But this traditional interpretation inevitably carries negative implications for those perceived to be intellectually inferior. For much of history, that included women, slaves, and, of course, persons with disabilities, especially those like my son Arthur with learning disabilities or intellectual or de developmental disabilities. Um, he, perhaps I should explain, he was a full-term baby but only premature weight because the placenta was insufficient and he was deprived of nourishment and oxygen in the latter stages of pregnancy and that's why his brain never developed properly. The intellectualizing tradition is deeply entrenched and elitist and presupposes a soul-body dualism which excludes people who, by the very fact that their brain damage profoundly affects their entire personality, challenges that analysis of how or what a human being is. The simple identification of God's image as the soul or mind is problematic. And so is the persistent claim particularly in modern Western Christianity, that each individual is made in God's image. 
The idea easily fits with modern individualism, of course, encouraging people to assert their rights, no matter what their race, religion or impairment, and indeed it can enhance dignity and respect for those who are not white, male, able-bodied and intelligent. But such individualism tends to exacerbate the prejudice that since we're made in God's image, we should all be perfect, perhaps implied by the title of this evening's discussion. Failure to reach notional perfection then becomes problematic. How can this person who has physical or mental defects be made in God's image? We'll come back to the question of human perfection in the second part, but meanwhile, I want us to return to the biblical text. In Genesis, Adam represents the whole human race. The very name means humankind. So my first point is that glib talk about each and everyone being made in God's image needs countering with sensitivity to the corporate nature of that image. The second point is that the image is marred by human gone wrongness. The fall of Adam didn't mean total loss of the image, as it was pointed out back in those early centuries. In Genesis 9-6, references again made to the fact that God created humankind in God's image, and that was why you shouldn't murder a human being. But, as St. Paul put it, all have fallen short of God's glory. Indeed, the Pauline epistles show how crucial is the parallel between Adam and Christ. And in Christ, we are a new creation. And as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Adam is the old humankind, Christ is the new humankind, and all of us, male and female, are in Adam and potentially in Christ, both being in some sense corporate figures. So, Christ is the true image and likeness of God. The image and likeness of God in Adam, the old humanity, is marred. It's in Christ that we are corporately in God's image. For being in Christ is being in the body of Christ, a corporate reality. For a body is made up of many members, all of whom bring different contributions to the whole. Indeed, Paul suggests that those body bits we are ashamed of and cover up are indispensable and the weak are to be especially honoured. And this is a physical image and the physical reality was that in his bodily existence Christ was abused, disabled and put to death. So it would seem that some aspects of God's image in Christ can only be reflected in the church by the full inclusion and honouring of those who have bodies that are likewise impaired. I well remember hearing Jean Vanier say that uh, he was the founder of the L'Arche Communities and Faith and Light um, he is himself now in hospital in Paris in his 90s and far from well. Um, so I remember him saying that Mother Teresa spoke of repulsion, compassion and wonderment. Once I passed through that sequence on successive visits to the original L'Arche community in France. First, there was my embarrassment at my own repulsion when sitting opposite Edith at the dinner table, slobbering her food, and didn't she love her red wine? And it came all the way down her front, didn't it? 
um, embarrassment because I couldn't help thinking maybe sitting at table with my Arthur people were embarrassed and repulsed and then compassion I was visiting again and found myself sitting with Edith on the sofa during evening prayers and here she was doing this all the time self-abuse all the time and I sat next to her and, and gently tried to restrain her and felt compassion and then finally wonderment I happened to visit again when Edith had just died at the wake person after person gave testimony to what Edith had meant to them it was all in French of course and my language was a little challenged but I could still get the point and then we went to the little chapel where Edith was laid out surrounded by flowers and candles still and at peace and in prayer with others I was overcome with wonderment now that kind of discernment is what allows recognition of God's image and likeness in human living and being and it rests on three significant shifts in perception the first is the corporate nature of God's image in humanity it's not something we each claim for ourselves but something we find in solidarity with one another and the second is that Christ is the true image of God the incarnate Christ is the true image of God in humankind and it's only as we participate in Christ that God's image is realized in us and the third is that in his bodily existence Christ was abused disabled and put to death and the hour of glory at least according to John's gospel was when Christ was lifted up on the cross entering the darkness of human impairment sin and suffering bearing it and transforming it so those with impairments belong to the body of Christ and mirror something fundamental about that body and that surely challenges the idea that since we're made in God's image we should all somehow be perfect what then do we imagine human perfection might be some of the fathers made a distinction between image and likeness we have the image through our creation they said but we build the likeness through our free choice that presupposes that the image remained but the likeness was lost by Adam's wrong choice and each has to work hard to regain it eventually to become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect as Jesus according to Matthew 5 48 uh, told us in my ecclesial tradition however perfection is not an achievement it's a gift of grace as John Wesley put it perfection is being grown up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and that surely involves those shifts in perspective the true image of God is Christ we are in the image in so far as we are in Christ and that is about solidarity indeed perfect love love of God love of neighbor love even of enemy 
John Wesley, the originator of Methodism, notoriously preached the doctrine of Christian perfection. It was and is widely misunderstood. In his own day, Wesley had to answer objections. Christians make no claim to be perfect in knowledge, he affirmed, nor to be free from error, nor without infirmities, nor are they free from temptation, he insisted. Defined as perfect love, he saw Christian perfection as something dynamic, not a state attained, nor something absolute, but something always improvable. Indeed, I quote, one perfected in love may grow in grace far swifter than he did before. Wesley stressed that security is never possible in this life, but he was adamant that the promises in Scripture were realisable. Now, there's one thing quite clear, and that is that Wesley was deeply influenced by the Macarian homilies. The spiritual homilies of Macarius have had a wide ecumenical afterlife. Their influence across the Byzantine world is patent. Several different collections are to be found in the manuscript traditions, as well as versions in Syriac, Arabic, Georgian, Latin and Slavonic. They also influenced Protestant pietism. They were published in an English translation in 1721 and in 1750 John Wesley included selections in the first volume of his Christian library. In fact, it's the first thing in the first volume of his Christian library, which was a compendium, a huge compendium uh, for the education of his preachers. The influence of Macarius on John Wesley is clear. His diary entry for July the 30th, 1736, indicates that travelling by boat in Georgia, that's the one across the Atlantic, by the way, not the one the other end of the Mediterranean, um, travelling by boat in Georgia with the wind set fair and later in the rain, he read Macarius and sang even when not a little affrightened by the falling of the mast, he again read Macarius and sang. Now Wesley and the author of those homilies had a common practical theology, a common drive towards perfection as the goal of the Christian life, a common emphasis on the incarnation and the Holy Spirit as the generators of perfection, a common stress on the love of God. Indeed, what Wesley did could be described as a democratizing of the old monastic ideal of holiness, Striving for perfection in Christ is what it's all about. In the Macarian homilies, there are frequent references to a mixing of the Holy Spirit with the human soul, to becoming one spirit with the Lord, to being changed into a divine nature. The mature Christian is one who's grown up through the ascetical struggle and been completed by the gift of the Spirit. Many passages speak of advancing to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ, or progressing from children's milk to the solid food of the mature. There is a profound oscillation between the need for constant struggle and the promise of reaching the goal, which is a return to paradise and restoration of the image of God. Renewal goes even further, however, by the power of the spirit and the spiritual regeneration. One not only comes to the measure of the first Adam, but also reaches a greater state than he possessed for man is divinized. Much of that paragraph was quotes from Macarius. Macarius confesses he has not yet seen any perfect Christian, 
Those who claim to be perfect are deceived by lack of experience. No matter how much a person is at rest in grace, experiencing mysteries, revelations, and the immense consolation of grace, sin still abides in him. Now, all of what I've been saying from Macarius could have come from Wesley. His doctrine of Christian perfection was derived from the same reading of scripture as we find in the Macarian homilies. It's built up out of the scriptural promises. Those who could not accept it did not trust God to fulfill those promises. Perfection is not something of which anyone can boast nor does it eliminate the possibility of struggle or future fall. Wesley affirms that none are ever wholly free from temptation. They may have the power to believe in Christ and to love God, yet feel in themselves something of pride or self-will, anger or unbelief. He then quotes Macarius, suggesting that while the inexperienced may imagine they have no more sin, the more mature recognize that even those who have the grace of God may be molested again. We have the first fruits of God's spirit, but the harvest is not yet. Christians are open to attack precisely where their strength lies, by concentrating on their guilt and sinfulness rather than the hope of the gospel, by letting their confidence in God's salvation wane. This is perhaps Wesley's version of the sin of Arcadia. The parallels between Wesley and Macarius are striking, not least in the choice of Pauline texts referring to adoption and new birth. Like Wesley, Macarius emerges as a theologian of Holy Spirit and transformation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creature, he says. For our Lord Jesus Christ came for this reason, to change and transform and renew human nature. Christ came to mingle human nature with his own spirit of the Godhead, to effect in those who believe a new mind, a new soul, new eyes, a new spiritual tongue, in a word, new humans, to pour into them new wine, which is the Spirit. And the Spirit is the Lord himself, shining in our hearts, and those who possess the Spirit fulfill all the commands justly. In the Christian tradition shared by orthodoxy and Methodism, perfection is not an achievement, nor does it necessitate absence of physical or mental impairment. It's transformation, transfiguration through Christ, found in communion, in solidarity, through perfect love, a love which generates the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The best example I've ever met is the L'Arche communities, where you don't find top-down charity, but profound mutuality, assistance giving and receiving grace from those who have profound disabilities. So, to my third part, Transfiguration. At the end of his remarkable hymn to love in 1 Corinthians 13, St. Paul writes, what we now see is like a dim image in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. In the ancient world, most mirrors would have been pretty dim. The best technology was polished metal. A clear image would perhaps appear in a perfectly still pool, and like Narcissus, you'd be entranced by the clarity of your own reflection. But generally, you'd only ever see yourself as a dim image in a mirror. Paul goes on, what I know now is only partial, then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. So was he talking about knowledge of God or self-knowledge? 
Maybe we see God dimly by dim reflections of divine glory in our own faces. Athanasius certainly thought that we should have recognised God not only through the creation, as Paul had suggested, but also through the image implanted in ourselves. The fact that we did not led to idolatry and sin and the only answer was to renew the image in us through the incarnation of God's image, God's word. But back to St Paul. In a long and complex passage elsewhere, Paul ponders the story of Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. Such divine glory was reflected in Moses' face that he had to put a veil over it, which he only removed when he turned to the Lord. Paul suggests the veil was to conceal how temporary the old covenant was and the veil is removed when a person turns to Christ. This was a novel way of reading um, the old covenant to show how in Christ the new covenant in the spirit is fulfilled and his climax is this. All of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Yes, God's image and glory is to be seen in our faces as we are transformed into the true image, which is Christ. And that must surely mean we're gradually drawn into the transfiguration. So let me share an illuminating night. I was with a group doing a sponsored trek up Mount Sinai for a disability charity. We were staying at a Bedouin eco-lodge in the midst of the desert. Darkness fell before six and in the blackness and clarity of the desert, the night sky was a sight beyond anything I'd seen before. Pinpoints of light everywhere with the Milky Way streaking with stunning brilliance across the heavens. Early to bed and challenged by the three hour time difference, I lay awake unable to sleep. A three hour meditation moved from scenes of the great and terrible wilderness, to use Deuteronomy's language, that we traversed on foot that day with its dry wadis and its amazing rock formations, to the prospect of the next day's trek up Mount Sinai. There it was that God spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Yet, when Moses asked God to show him his glory, the response was, I will make all my goodness <coughs> pass before you, but you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen." From Moses, thoughts turned to Elijah, the prophet who ran away to the same mountain to escape opposition and found God not in storm, earthquake or fire, but in that still, small voice, probably better translated, a sound of sheer silence. Next day, I would discover Elijah's basin partway up the mountain. But that night, my mind slipped from no one can see me and live to the moment when the disciples discerned the glory of the Lord as Jesus was transfigured on the mountain and was joined by Moses and Elijah. Emerging from the pitch black of the stone sleeping hut, I found the desert transfigured by the silvery light of the moon. 
and then in the morning, before our ascent up the mountain, I found myself in the church of St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, and there glimpsed in the apse the famous early mosaic of Christ's transfiguration, to which the church is dedicated. The icon shows Christ bathed in light against the dark blue depths of God's eternal infinity. No one can see God and live. God's presence is in a still, small voice. It's hard to hear. We see only God's back. Yet God's glory is seen in the face of Christ, and insofar as we are in Christ, we may reflect that glory, even if only dimly. And sometimes we catch a glimpse in another's face, in an everyday saint who somehow embodies the love of Christ, or in someone who needs us to show the love of Christ, one of those whom neither the sheep nor the goats recognised, someone hungry or thirsty, a stranger, someone with no adequate clothing, sick or in prison, someone with disabilities. It's even possible for a face-to-face -face meeting to put us in both places at once, meeting each other's mutual neediness. So another L'Arche story. Again, I was visiting the original L'Arche community in Trollibroy and spending the evening at one of the foyers. A man with Down syndrome settled on the floor at my feet placed his arms round my knees and stared into my face with love and concentration all through the prayer time and on. Our mutual gaze became deeply significant as I began to sense that he was offering me the wordless response of love which at the time I scarcely received from my own severely disabled son. His name was Christophe, Christ Bearer. What we now see is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Thank you very much for your, for your paper. Um, it's, it's difficult to um, add something to what you said, and um, I'll, I'll do my best to um, try to just ask some of, I mean, to, to try to ask some of the questions that for me are going to illuminate a little bit more, uh, are going to allow you to expand a little bit more on some of the points you've made in the paper. Um, one of the things that I, um, I think I'd like to, to hear more about is um, the way in which we can discern the image of Christ in the others, in the community or in the gifts they can bring to the church. Because you said the, the image of Christ in us is, uh, the image of Christ is corporate, and so each of us, and persons with disabilities as well, have um, that image and how we can discern that image and, and how we can discern those gifts in the context of the church for instance that would be mm -hmm. one question um, the other question would be um, how we can speak about perfection outside the church uh, for instance in the case of persons with disabilities that are born in other um, in non-Christian background, because um, you said perfection is a gift of grace, would that apply in a non-Christian context? And if you have any thoughts on that, I would be very grateful. Um, and finally, my my last point would be regarding you've met, you spoke about contemplation, mm. and 
I mean, from what I, um, from one of the things I uh, remember about contemplation and the transfiguration that is brought by contemplation is basically an exercise of admiration. While you mm -hmm. admire something, you become one with mm -hmm. the thing you admire. And in the context of your book where you are talking about Arthur and his joy for light and shades and trees, would that somehow, how, how do you see that, that play, that, con that would be Arthur's contemplation of light in a way, something that would transfigure him in a way, or I, I don't know, it's just, these are just some of the thoughts and the questions I thought I'd like to hear. Thank you. I think I'm going to say something about the middle one first. Um, six and a half years ago, we got to the stage where we had to take the decision after caring for Arthur for 45 years at home um, that uh, we would have to um, move him into residential care. And um, so he is now in a little home with six residents, all six of them with very, very profound disabilities. Um, and none of them have much meaningful language. Many of them need assistance with the basic thing of feeding, let alone anything else. Um, and um, so there is a fairly high level of staffing um, and we've just been through a whole assessment process because they need more staffing because Arthur's needs are greater than they were when he went there. Um, so um, you can see that we're in a situation where you've got uh, six adults, three men and three women, uh, who need total care and staff come in and out and do night duty and, and all the rest of it. Arthur's key worker, his name is Gamal. So he comes from a Muslim background. And he is absolutely devoted to him. He's not on duty on Tuesday, but Arthur has a hospital appointment and he's coming in to take Arthur to the hospital. Um, what I see in that little home are a group of extraordinary people. It's not like a large community and having an, an underlying Christian foundation or commitment. And indeed there are large communities in India where Muslims, Christians and Hindus are all living and working together. Um, there is something I think I mean, we might want to say it's about Christ being in all of humanity, if you like. The anonymous Christ, if you like. Um, there is something about the Christ-likeness of people. And it is in those committed to people with profound disabilities that I have seen a quality which is genuinely the fruits of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace. I often say these are the fundamental human values which Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit. Um, and I think we have to take really seriously that our God is the God who created everything and everyone and ultimately this is the God we have discerned in Christ and this God is there before we are or before Christ is named. Does that help with question number two? Very much, well. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that answers question number one, you know? Yeah. It's discerned in the mutuality of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, da, da 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 I once heard somebody say, if you can recite the list, you're halfway there. I can never recite the list. So <laughs> I've got a long way to go. Um, but, but it seems to me those are the fundamental human values. 
and, uh, and they are the fruits of the Spirit. So again, there is a kind of, um, you know, a, you, you need to name the Christian dimension, the Christian discernment, mm-hmm. while not making it exclusive, it seems to me. Mm-hmm. And that actually it is in these extreme circumstances that very often these fundamental dimensions of human reality are discovered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your third question, I've forgotten. Um, it, it was about contemplation. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yes, I think it wasn't, it wasn't. I think it was really trying to say something about where the previous section had led me. Um, and saying something about perfection being a gift of grace which transfigures us or catches us up into the transfiguration of Christ and um, it was a combination of of meditating on Paul and uh, and being in that place which called forth the image of transfiguration Um, so that it sounded as though, well, I was sharing a a contemplation, if you like, but what I was really trying to do was to capture something of of what this image of God meant, this this gift of the image and likeness of God, which comes when we are transfigured in Christ. Okay. Thank you.